Welcome to the Hard Lead Business Show, where compassion meets commerce and leaders lead with love. Join your host, Tom Jacobs, as he delves into the insightful conversations with visionary business leaders who defy the status quo, putting humanity first and profit second. From heartfelt strategies to inspiring stories, this podcast is your compass in the world of conscious capitalism. So buckle up and let your heart guide your business journey. Ladies and lean loving gents, fasten your giggle girth and get ready for a jolly journey towards jubilance with Lisa Swanson. This wizard dress of weight won'ts is weaving wonders for women of wisdom on their quest to reclaim their radiant waistlines. Ready to rumble with some relatable revelations on the heart led business show? Well, stay tuned because we're going to dive deep into the labyrinth of light hearted business learning with Lisa. So let's lunge into this episode. Lisa, welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you so much for having me here. So good to have you. So one of the first questions I ask everybody is, what's your definition of a heart-led business? That is a great question, and this really fits in with my journey that I have been on. And a heart-led business to me is one that doesn't just lead by numbers, like sales or the number of clients or ROI, but also puts an emphasis on making sure that their clients are a good fit for the program. One that emphasizes empathizes, I should say, with their clients and provides a service they can be proud of without compromising their own boundaries. Oh, that's beautiful. How's that for a good synopsis? That's a, that's a beautiful <laughs> synopsis and definition of a heart-led business. So what inspired you to start a heart-led business? Well, you know, <laughs> there are two things. I was thinking about this. What inspired me? I, I can go with two different things. One is my dad. So my dad was an entrepreneur, lots of entrepreneurs in my family. So specifically, my dad owned uh, two different grocery stores at different times. And on the side, he built houses. He was always somebody creative and doing things for himself. And one of the lessons that he taught me as I was you know, getting to the age of trying to figure out what do I want to do and what's going to be important? And he said, it doesn't matter. <laughs> he goes, it doesn't matter what you do, but whatever it is, you be the best at it that you can be. Know that you gave it 100% to provide the best service, the best work, the best outcome for everybody involved. Because it's not just about you. I loved that when I say, because it's not just about you. It's what you're creating for your life and for each person your business touches and how it's going to affect them. Oh, wow. And I was like, oh, wow, right? Like that <laughs> to me was like the most important thing. He's like, I don't care if you want to be a garbage can collector. You know, it doesn't matter, but you're going to be the best damn one out there. And you're going to, you're going to get to know the people on the route. And you're going to like, right. it was all about who are you connecting with, mm -hmm. with whatever job you have, right? Because you're going to change lives. How, how, and at changing lives. Oh, sorry. Well, I, I was just going to say, changing lives to him was even just if you put a smile on somebody's face that day, because it could be, you never know, it could be that person's worst day of their life. But if you could have made us put a smile on their face, you made a big, huge difference, you know, because you're never going to know how much of an impact. And I was probably in my mid teens. I oh. was not the type who liked school. No. I wanted to leave school early. He was like, no, you're not doing that. <laughs> but I wanted to get out of school. I worked for him in his grocery store. And so, but I was always thinking about what do I want to do? And I was always thinking like, it's like, I mean, I'll be a hairdresser and then I'll own the studio. Maybe I'll work with dogs and I'll own the kennel. You know, I always went to that level of it. Or that was the way my mind worked. But I think he, him definitely was the first insight into what we do. It's not just about me. Right. It's about everybody that you touch. And we touch so many different people in our lives. And, and sometimes that we're not even aware of. Yeah. There's a author yeah. that, that I heard about. I haven't read the book, but he went on a quest to thank everybody in the supply chain that provided his cup of coffee in the morning. Wow. He said oh, there were over a thousand people that he had to go thank. That's amazing. This Think about that. A thousand people for a cup of coffee. Right. Yeah, from the growers oh. to the pack, you know, to the barista, you know, it's everybody, the truck driver that, you know, right. How amazing, like, talk about impacting other people's lives. Like, that's incredible. And what great advice from your father and, and at such a young age as well. Like, how did that transform you? Well, hmm. how did it transform? I, th I think it, it shifted how I looked at what I wanted to do with my life. 
you know, when they, when you start thinking about how do I affect other people, I think it changes what do you want to do instead of coming from, well, let's see, what job is going to make me the most money? Like where, you know, and not just, I mean, I think we all do need to be happy with what we do and we do want to earn a certain amount of money. It's just not that we can just ignore that. You know, I'm, I'm not going to, I, I know I like to have nice things, so I'm going to want to do something that's going, going to afford the nice things and live a lifestyle that pleases me. But you also have to look at who you affect. So I think, you know, maybe that's why I got into, I didn't get directly into coaching. I struggled. Unlike I had brothers and sisters. I come from a family of seven oh, brothers wow. and sisters. Yeah, a lot. And, at the grocery store. You know, <laughs> yeah, nobody's at the grocery store. One, one went to the grocery store business with them. But there was, you know, all of them, like they went to school, they knew what they wanted to do. They had this path. And I was always the one that was sort of like going in different <laughs> directions, like not knowing what, what is Lisa going to do? You know, <laughs> which um, number were you? I was um, fourth, one, two, three, four, fifth from the top. Oh, okay. Kind of middle ish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's middle-ish. It was sort of, yeah, it was middle-ish because the four oldest we called the big kids and the three youngest we called the little kids because there was a space. My mother had kids every year and then there was a space and then she had the last three. So I was like the oldest of the last three. Okay. So we were the little kids. Okay. Um, it's, it's funny how families do things like that. Yeah. But yeah, it just makes you think about, you know, what do I want to do with this life? What kind of impact is it going to have? And am I going to enjoy it? Because that's part of it too. We have to enjoy what we're doing. We can't go to a job where we're miserable. And then, you know, we all know the person at the checkout counter who hates the job, right. right? We don't want to send that energy out there. So how did it impact me? I think it was just looking at the broader picture. Nice. Uh, cool. So tell me, what is your business now? So my business now is Body and Soul Coaching. And actually, this is the, the reason I got here was because I knew I wanted to coach. I knew I wanted to get into fitness. I was very curious with the body. I ended up in a franchise. Mm. And so that franchise, you know, at first it was very exciting. I was learning a lot about growing a business and, you know, what numbers do you track and what's the marketing, what's the sales, the hiring, the firing, learning all those things. But every single thing I learned in the business, it was all number driven, number driven. And even to the point of pitting one studio against the number, against Ooh. the next studio, like who had the highest sales numbers. I was with them for about a decade. And I'll tell you, by the time I left, I was no longer living a healthy lifestyle. I was working out. I was eating right. I was, I competed. I was built. You know, people are probably like, oh, Lisa's in great shape. I was exhausted. I was working myself to the ground. I had no personal boundaries and I completely lost my intuition. And mm -hmm. at some point, I can't remember what happened. It was, actually, it was right around my 50th birthday. I was just like, something needs to give here. I'm not enjoying this life. And I'm going to have a heart attack if I continue at this pace. Mm -hmm. This is all leading up to my business now. Yeah. And, and somebody said, well, listen to your intuition. I realized, I said, like, I don't have any intuition. <laughs> I don't even know what that sounds like anymore. And I really had to just start to ground myself. Which book did I get? It's a small book by, oh, what's his name? John Randolph, I think. I think it's called John Randolph. Oh, oh, I can't remember the name of the book. I wish I knew. And it was a small book and it had these meditations that you did each day to just sort of connect into, into like what you wanted to do and connecting to the universe, connect to your guys and all this. And I really started listening to my intuition. And I started saying, do I really want to be with this franchise? And it was just this big like, no, <laughs> that I could feel. It's like, okay, that's not the thing to do. And it's like, and then I had this vision of body and soul coaching, which was much more nurturing. And it called it body and soul because it had to do with fitness and nutrition, yes, but it also had to do with the mindset. It had to do with helping people figure out their identities, their health identity, getting past limiting beliefs, and really empowering women to be their own nutritionist, to mm -hmm. work on this because they, I don't want, I didn't want anybody to have to come to me for life, you know, like diets that are out there. It's like do the diet and then come back again when you gain the weight back. Right. I didn't want that. So that's why I called it body and soul coaching. And when I said, hey, I said to myself, I own and I created body and soul coaching. It's like, boom, this light went off. And that's like, okay, that's my intuition saying, yes, go that route. And so that's how body and soul coaching first came about. Oh, that's very cool. And so that, that was really your purpose. Like you were leading, if I may paraphrase from what I heard, is sure. you were living what you wanted to do with the franchise, but it wasn't your purpose. It kind of transformed into that just the numbers thing and just trying to do better than the neighbor, you know, the neighboring studio. And then exactly. you found your purpose that aligned with your 
inner self as well with body and soul coaching. Exactly. Sure. And I think everything serves its purpose. Yeah. Yeah. I, I see your trophy in the back as well. Is that for your, a bodybuilding competition that you did? Yes. Yeah. Yes. That was a bodybuilding. Well, I'm not bodybuilding. I didn't go that far. It was fitness. fitness. You know, they have the different levels. Yeah. So that it's was fitness. Routine and yeah. doing the routine. The fitness routine. No, back then, I think you did not have, there was another level between it where you didn't have to do a routine. Oh, figure. Figure. Actually, right. I, let me say correct. It was figure. Then there was fitness. Then there was bodybuilding. I did figure. Okay. Awesome. I did a yes. bodybuilding competition. When it's I was fascinating. Doing... You learn a lot about yourself. Absolutely. And some not so great things about yourself either in the, those last <laughs> two weeks before competitions. <laughs> tough. 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 Yes. I actually took my daughter through a competition one time too. She was going through a difficult time. She wants something to focus on. And I don't know how we started talking about it, but she goes, I'll do a competition. Oh, yeah. Will you coach me? And I said, oh, I don't know. <laughs> but I did. She did very well. But you do. You learn a lot about yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Both the mental and the physical aspects too. Yes. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, cool. So, yeah. you know, how do you balance then making a profit and staying aligned with your core values and doing what you love and leading with your heart? You know, oh, they're so interconnected. I felt like, okay, so let, let's go back to the franchise days when I was yeah. feeling so disconnected. So it was during those days I knew I wanted to create body and soul coaching. I hadn't sold my businesses yet. And I was really starting to connect to my inner soul to my spirit. I firmly believe in our guides and spirits being around us. And I was really connecting with them. And it was really funny. I had this group of trainers that they were okay, but they weren't into it. They were just about how many clients can I get? They could care less about helping the business grow. And they just, you know, you know, those trainers. And I had made some changes and I lost my entire staff. And through all of this work I had been done doing spiritually, I was like, that's okay. They're not meant to be here. And the next month, sales were very low. And I can remember talking to, um, you know, one of the upper echelons of the franchise. It's like, yeah, you know, you, you, lost your, <laughs> you lost your staff. You're not bringing money in this month. I said, no, that's okay. I said, I'm not meant to bring people in this month. You know, I, I have to be prepared for them. And along comes this trainer who ended up being one of my absolute best trainers ever, just happens to walk in the door and said, are you looking for help? Yeah. I said, as a matter of fact, I am, right? So I talked to him and he, oh, he was fantastic. And through him and one other, one person who did not leave a, and a manager and myself, we had like the biggest month ever. And that was without any marketing. Huh. It was with just giving the clients what they needed. It was working as a team. And just like, I remember people walking in the studio going, wow, this place vibrates with energy. Mm. I'm like, okay, I know, I know this is what it is. So I really believe it's not that you can just say, oh, I'm going to manifest this. I hate when people say that. It's, I think it's knowing how to ground yourself, right? You're manifesting from above, but you're grounding yourself in what aligns best with you, what's in harmony with your own energy, and then doing the steps that you need to also bring the money in. Because you can't just focus on one or the other. It doesn't work. I think it's the marriage of the two that really creates that. And that's actually what I'm learning with Body and Soul Coaching as I came online and just started this business up and just watched it grow. And people are like, well, where do your clients come from? I say, my website. And it's like, oh, do you do Google ads? And it's like, nope. It's organic. <laughs> and like that's the majority of where people are coming from. And I have to chalk that up to its energy. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting too that you, know, even with the, you know, let's get the profits up, let's look at the numbers, let's compete against that other studio and all that. It was still just kind of you know, floating along and you had this huge staff. Yet when it came down to people that were aligned and were giving over, you know, to their clients and delivering a great product and service, yeah. that's when things started taking off. And you were, probably weren't even looking at the numbers too much then either. Exactly. I mean, you get them, of course, because you want to be smart, but you're not. But when you have a team, like as a, I always try to teach my team, I said, every single client that walks in here should believe that you're their favorite client. And every time they walk out the door, they want to feel better than when they walked in the door. I said, if you just follow that, you'll have a client for life. Yeah. 
And, and that's, they embraced that when you have a team that can embrace that and you can embrace that with your team too, because it's not just about taking care of our clients. It's about taking care of our team. And when they know that you care about them. And I think that's another thing I learned. I was very much in you know, probably a lot of entrepreneurs out there, very much a control freak. No, I will do it. Nobody can do it like me. Right. And I can remember when I, I started having those shifts around this at the same time, when they started asking my questions, I'd say, that's a great idea. Why don't you guys run with it? And they'd be like, Lisa wants us to run with it, <laughs> the control freak, right? But think of the power that that gave them and not the power of, wow, we're in control, the power of, hey, I'm important. I yeah. matter here. Right. And I have yeah. a choice or I have a voice in the business. Yeah. Yeah, or right. taking somewhat ownership of what they're doing. And I think employees get a lot of pride out of that as mm -hmm. well. They do. And I think a lot of times we're afraid to give them some mm -hmm. of that because we're afraid that they can't, oh, they're not going to do it as well as me. They might end up doing it better, Absolutely. you know, <laughs> or even if they don't do it as well, that's okay. Let them learn. Yeah. I owned a fitness studio as well and had trainers. And when I transitioned from, you know, working on the floor and and building the business to just building the business, you know, it was probably the same thing that you were going through. Like, oh, I can't give up my clients. Like, nobody's going to be able to train them as well as me. Like, and you know what? They got better results with the people that were training them <laughs> than, than they did with me. I was like, well, let's see, there you go. Exactly. Should, yeah. It was, it's so interesting. Yeah. One of the SOPs that I put together when I had the facility was small talk. So how to have small talk with the clients and just gave like little, little questions to ask. And I was listening to somebody else's podcast the other day and they were talking about the Ford method, F-O-R-D, not the car, but mm -hmm. F-O-R-D. So it's family, occupation, relationship, and dreams. So those are the four questions that, that you should be asking or the, the type of topics to talk to people about. Right. They're like, Oh yeah, that, like that makes sense. Like that's what people love to talk about their family. Right. They do for work, recreation, what they do for fun, and then the D is their dreams and aspirations. That oh, that's pretty good. I've never heard of that before. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. it probably came from a hotel chain or something like that. But this fitness center in, installed that into their kind of SOPs in terms of how do you relate to people? on a person-to-person -person basis. Oh, well, that's great. And you know what's probably needed now this time than any other time, because I don't think people do know how to relate very well. There's so much social media. And if you look at the way people talk to each other on social media, yeah. it's like, I, I, exactly. That sounds, that's it all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that says it all. Sometimes I look at it, it's like, would you say that if you were in front of that person? Oh, you, Probably you, not. No, I've been on YouTube for, I don't know, like 10 years or so. And somebody had written a comment that was really rude to, to me is some, something like, oh, you have really big ears or something like that. I'm like, well, yeah, it's better to listen. But then I was like, <laughs> would you have said that to me if you were standing in front of me? And the person, and I think by, by the name, it was a, a woman, said, are you threatening me? I'm like, no, you were just insulting me. So I'm just asking, like, would you say that to me if you weren't right. on a keyboard and were standing in front of me. It was just, it was really interesting dialogue. So finally I just deleted the comments and went on with my day. Yeah, you have yeah. to, you have to be able to ignore it and shut those things out. I know a coach I had worked at that one time and she had gotten so many, you know, she had reached, you know, pretty big business that she has. And she would have people telling her her nose was too big or her nostrils were too big. And why do you talk fast? And why do you, it's like, it's a beautiful woman. You yeah, know, it's right. like, I don't know why they're ripping her apart. Who knows why? But, you know, people, they say the bigger you get, yeah. the more trolls you get. All the crazies come out. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's really just yeah. about their insecurities. It has nothing to do with you. You know, right. it's crazy. Right. Yeah. Need to remember that. Need yes. to remember that. Definitely. <laughs> For sure. Some days it's harder than others. When you're talking about putting the people first, and that's really an interesting way of running a business rather than, you know, putting the profits first. So when you look back at the studio environment and then your business today and compare them, like what's the... What's the scale of your happiness for each of those? Oh my goodness. It's night and day. <laughs> it's night and day. My Okay, so if we're going to go on a scale of one to 10, my t yeah. happiness is 10. And that does not mean that I never have a bad day. 
I have bad days. That's life, right? The stress is in life. That's okay. I can deal with that. But I am living my life with the boundaries set up that I want them to be. I am listening to my intuition, right? I know how to do that without letting ego mind come in and drive Mm -hmm. things instead. And I think before I didn't realize that it was probably more down towards like a two, a three. It was that bad. I didn't realize how bad it was till I got out because too many things in my life were suffering because of it, because I was working all the time. Like people say, you work a lot. And I say, yeah, I know. They're like, no, you really work a lot to the point of, you know, I didn't have time with my husband. I didn't have time to take care of all those dogs I had that we talked about, Uh, you know, spending time with my children. You know, just I realized how many parts of my life suffered because I was just like this hyper focused into the business. Yeah. And then when looking at like the profit side of it, what's the difference in terms of your fulfillment in the bank account versus the fulfillment in your bank account today? Like what's the not numbers, of course, I don't want to dive into that. But like, what's right. the, the value of that happiness? Yeah, and night and day again with that one. And I think, and it's not that I didn't make money in the other business, I did, but it was always just this drive. And it's just like, okay, now uh, you, you'd get to one month, you did okay, okay, now the next month, like immediately, let's get on that month, we have to make money this month, which I started learning as towards the end of that, because I was getting more into spirituality and learning how to set those boundaries and respect that. And I was just getting even in better at business because we all grow in business as well. So it became more pleasurable, you know, bringing, driving those numbers in and keeping my boundaries. And now I, I have a much smaller team, very small team. I had 26 employees back then. Now it's just like I have a content manager and a couple of assistant coaches. Nice. Yeah. So it's nice and tight and small and I like it that way. So I'm, I try to remember the first question, make sure I answer the question properly. What yeah, was the initial question? Is profit better now than it was when you were just looking at the numbers? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the simple answer is yes, it's absolutely better now. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's amazing. And I, I think that's a really good lesson for a lot of people struggling with having a business that might be struggling a little bit in terms of the numbers and, and then making bad decisions based on The numbers and the bad decisions being taking on people that aren't aligned with you or doing things that just don't feel good. But at the end of the day, it brings money. Like, how do you get over that? Right. Yeah, I think that's a tough one to get over. And I I said, you have to detach yourself from the outcome. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't we cannot be connected to the number of sales that we have. We cannot be connected to the number of clients we have or the number uh, how much money we have in our bank account. I think when we start when we connect to that, meaning we are we're giving value to ourselves based on how many clients we have and how much money is in our bank account. That's never going to be good for you. And I, I think you have to learn that lesson before you can grow bigger. Because I know I used to compare myself. So that's another one. Don't compare yourself to others. When I would compare myself to other people and be like, oh, how they had a $50,000 a month. Why aren't I doing a $50,000 month? You know, you start looking at that, you immediately bring this energy around you that's not going to let you succeed. Because you're sort of showing the universe like, okay, well, this is making me anxious. I can't deal with that. I'm not going to go with that. But as soon as you can sort of let go of that, detaching yourself from the outcome and say, you know what, whether I bring in 10,000, 5,000, 2,000 or 50,000 this month, I am still valuable. I am still the same person that I am, no matter what that number is. And then if it doesn't come in, it's like, okay, that's interesting. What could I do differently? Mm -hmm. It's a hard, a hard one to learn. And I think when you can start practicing that in your daily life and you can practice that in your business in ways like when you say don't bring on people who aren't in alignment with you how about those sales calls and you're talking to somebody you're like oh my gosh i do not want to coach this person uh, yep. and in the beginning right we have those things in the beginning you're like oh you bring them on and they are just so draining they take so much energy away from you i have learned over the years don't let them in Tell them, I'm sorry, this is not a good fit for you. Yeah. And it's okay to say that. Let them go find somebody who is a good fit. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh, it'll save you so much agony. And and then you have less time to spend the business because you bring in clients that are in alignment with you. They're so easy to work with. Yeah. Right? It makes everything much more pleasurable. Absolutely. 100%. I used to have yeah. a question in my sales consultation at the fitness center. It's like, on a scale of 1 to 10, how committed are you to achieving your goals? 
And if somebody said a seven or less, I was like, you know what? Not going to work. Sorry. Have a good day. I wish you all the best. And I, I think maybe I only had a handful that just were not committed. And almost every time they're like, oh, no, 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 no. Wait, like, I'll be committed. I'll be committed. I like, really? <laughs> like, explain that a little bit for me. Like, how's that change? And we'd have a really good dialogue. And a lot of times those became some of the best clients that got the best results because they had the hard truth that, you know what, this is not going to work. Like if, if you're not committed right. to this, right. it's not going to work. And I don't want to work with you if you're not going to do the work. Exactly. That's such an important conversation to have. And it's important for people to know any of you out there selling, coaching, or whatever you sell, you need to be able to say that to somebody. I start my conversations out by saying, okay, this is what we're going to be going through. And at the end of this, we'll see if this is a good fit yep. for, for us. If it's not, don't worry about it. I'm not going to worry about it. If it is a good fit, then we'll take a look at coaching. We'll get you going. And I had a manager at one time who had a really hard time with sales. I think sometimes I think I'm a unicorn because I know a lot of people in this business who just don't like sales. I love sales. I absolutely love sales because I have fun with it. It's a conversation. And I think that's what I was trying to teach my manager. I said, because he was this great guy. He had a wonderful personality. The clients loved him. The other business owners like in the same complex, they loved him, but he'd get into the sales and it was like tense. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, Jay, calm down. You know, and it's like, what's going on? So we started talking about what was going on in his head. And he's like, well, you know, I know you need to make money and I get nervous about, am I going to close them? I said, don't worry about that. Put that out of your head and have a conversation. And your only thought is, is this person a good fit? If they're not, I'm going to tell them they're not. And if they are, I'm going to say, okay, you're a good fit. That's all I want you to worry about. And when he made that shift in his mind, he started closing like 80% of his sales. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. yeah. So that that detachment. Yeah. That detachment is what it takes. Like if you're so tied up into the result, that's where all the pressure comes. And the prospect feels that during the sales conversation mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. That's really Oh, Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Right. It's just like, then, you, then you're trying to pull them in and it's just yeah. like, you don't want to feel like that. You don't want, no. you want them to lean into you. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, exactly. Right. Right. Well, Lisa, our time is coming to a close here. I want to thank you so much for sharing your words of advice and wisdom from your years of experience on both sides of the fence, if, as it were. But yes. if people are interested in learning more about what you do, how can they get a hold of you? Well, they can always follow me on social media. It's usually at Lisa Swanson Fit for Instagram and LinkedIn and Lisa Swanson Health Coach on Facebook. But you can always even email me at Lisa at Body and Soul Coaching dot com, which is my website. Awesome. Well, we'll link all that up into the show notes. And Lisa, again, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you. It was a pleasure. I, what a wonderful conversation. Thank you. You're welcome. And to our listeners and viewers out there, thank you so much for coming and listening to the show today. And I want to ask you to make sure you're checking out what Lisa is doing and all that will be linked up in the show notes. And also, if you could do us a favor and share this episode with a friend or family member that could use the advice and you know become more of a heart-led business and stop looking at the numbers all the time. So until next time, lead with your heart. You've been listening to The Heart-Led Business Show, hosted by Tom Jacobs. Join us next time for another inspiring journey into the heart of business.